Hello, what's up guys? Uh, Fatis here. So, so the purpose of this uh, video is for me uh, as a newbie. Basically, I, uh, I want to apply TypeScript uh, into my project. So basically, I want to reflect the uh code that i've written in javascript to basically use typescript or implement typescript but uh, i do know the it would be hard for me to do that because i don't have any uh like prior knowledge of it or experience uh like coding in typescript so this video we're gonna go through typescript uh, together as a newbie uh, but uh, disclaimer I do uh, like go through some videos about TypeScript so uh, what is types uh, uh, what is types actually is but I didn't like go through the doc the proper documentation of TypeScript uh, for me not nah, I mean like personally uh, for me uh, the way I learn things is by uh, right away create a project and uh, do TypeScript stuff or any other language stuff and just when when in all uh, so basically I learn it through coding instead of learning through uh, reading documentations so that's what I'm gonna do in this uh, particular series uh, so at the end uh, we, we're gonna try to refactor a, a project uh, together uh, but I'm gonna confirm that later with you guys but for now uh, what I'm gonna do is uh, we're gonna go through letting TypeScript together and create a new TypeScript project and basically uh, finish that app web app actually so uh let's go let's go through that guys yep uh so today's uh topic would be uh regarding get to know typescript together as a typescript newbie yep so let's uh, uh let me uh let's share with you what we gonna do throughout this uh series actually so instead of just this video uh, i'm gonna do like a light yeah, introduction of what we're gonna do throughout this series uh, so this is gonna be the episode one regarding uh, uh, getting to know typescript as a newbie but eventually what we're gonna do is basically yeah, let's uh try to so basically uh ooh, our main purpose obviously uh, main purpose uh, should be uh, create a, a complete event system uh, using time stream yep and uh, for this particular uh, project I'm gonna use uh, next Next.js framework or library, I don't know, maybe even library, right? So I'm gonna use Next.js framework with uh, MUI, method UI theme, M MUI theme basically. Yep. Uh, uh, for your uh, for your guys' information, uh, I came from a backend developer, so. Uh, I don't know how to like say to this to you guys. I recently just become a full stack developer, so basically, uh, I also have to code front end stuff, uh, which I don't. Uh, I can say myself I don't like expert in the front end stuff. Uh, I, I do know about CSS, HTML, or CSS, SAS, uh, JavaScript, all kind of that thing. Uh, I kind of knew to JavaScript also like. Uh, just shy more than one year uh, and learn about React, React Jazz, and then Next Jazz afterwards. Uh, 
so basically what i want to say to you guys the reason why i go with mui theme because i don't have to go through like uh create something from the scratch i mean the ui side the look of the uis uh, i i just want to like uh, just reuse uh any uh pre uh, uh i mean uh, you already have a uh, pre-design uh tabs navigations all that kind of ui stuff that we usually use in the system so that's why i'm go i go with mui theme uh some of you that uh comes from a brand background so you might use different theme or you might don't use them at all like uh my friends come from friend development uh background so he preferred to uh, not use any kind of theme uh currently he's using i can't remember what is it but that one is uh, uh so popular what's his name i can't remember what is it uh, it's kind of like it, you have you install a package you can basically uh it's not a complete theme you have to purchase a theme in order for you to like use uh, the theme but you have the ability to like uh do the css but much more easier than just a bare bone css or styling i can't remember why it's, i think it's, the name should start with t or something right uh Let's search for front end. Oh, sorry about that, guys. Front end uh, theming package. I don't know that that's supposed to be. Uh, it's not bootstrap. I can't remember what I did. Maybe I should like. Should I use uh, bootstrap over? I can't remember. Uh, oh, is it a framework, right? Front and framework 2022. It's about. Uh, yeah, actually guys we do have a lot of framework you can like select uh, any framework that you want to go with but i don't think this is the one then what is it uh? i can't remember what is it uh css framework for react maybe maybe ui framework Yeah, we do. I already mentioned about material UI, but it's not here, guys. It's not here. It's not here. Why is it not here? No, that's not it. That's not it. It's all right, guys. I can't remember what is it. So basically, uh, you can uh, use uh your own way, uh, what you wanted to use. But uh, for this particular series, I'm gonna use Next.js with the MUI theme uh reason why i'm using mui team like i said earlier i can just like uh, copy and paste uh, uh all the stuff that they already have on their theme like an uh, the uh, the input field all that kind of thing so i don't have to like a uh, create one from the scratch or basically style one from the scratch uh so i i can just right away copy and paste them and use it in my uh, system so yeah like i said we're gonna build a event system so the main uh, focus of this uh, web app is basically i'm gonna create something that because uh, i'm currently doing a, a partnership with my friend so we want to build a system where we can basically handle any event 
basically this event system is like a services for our client who want to like create or uh, like run an event so most uh, the big feature in this would be like a calendar event where and uh, where they can track all the event uh, timeline or management and at the same time we thinking of using uh, like a, uh, not using I mean I mean like we thinking of uh, building a feature where we can expedite registration uh, process uh, we're gonna have a, like a bunch of way where we, how people can register into our system uh, not not into our system basically re register to come into uh, an event that was created by our uh, client let's say for example uh, we have, let's say for example our event system uh, web app uh, we can get a lot of uh, like client let's say you want to register as uh, a uh, program master or so best uh, what I mean by is that I don't know what's the, the right word for that I mean like we have different type of users so basically the first type of user will be uh, the one who gonna hold uh, the event so let's just say pro program master right so the one who's gonna hold the event so this uh, type of user uh, gonna create like a event content uh, uh, I, I can't what kind of event is gonna be like uh, 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 we're gonna support like a variety kind of event but more the main feature for our system is uh, to handle registration part uh, that's the first one uh, second one would be uh, lucky draw uh, to whoever uh, use a second type of user which is uh, the one who uh, applied to go to that event uh, so this is like contestant or some kind of thing so uh, yeah that's the second feature but the main feature which is registration part uh, we want to use uh, uh, the first option would be uh, the our client can use our system uh, to help them register user by just using a card reader uh, you just user can insert their uh, my card so i'm living in malaysia so we have a identification card uh, so you user can use their id or identification card or ic uh, on that uh, card reader and then from our website we can just read uh, through that card reader and get information of the uh, people that come into the event who want to register into the system uh easily using our system and basically our client can get uh, very detailed information of the user uh, using our system so basically uh, this system is uh it's not that complicated unless you add a lot of features in it uh you know the, to make it more than just a registration uh features right so basically the main feature we're gonna have uh, is gonna be uh, registration uh, using uh, card reader so basically what's going or uh, this is gonna be like your uh, id card yep so and that information of a uh, user that uh, information of people that register into the register to our event uh, our client able to get a hold of that uh, people information yep that's uh, the main purpose of the system right now other features uh, we are still thinking of uh, what kind of feature we want to add more that's why I said we might have uh, 
let's say we might have uh, like a lucky draw features. Uh, let's say you register to a, uh, an event and that event have a lucky draw session. Uh, and the basic after you finish that event or basically you have to like uh, collect all stalls uh stamp or something like that uh and you gotta get a lucky draw or something like that hamper or anything i don't know uh that's just some idea and we also want to have a uh like a calendar uh a calendar event uh, handler something like that so basically we have a big calendar where our client can just click on the calendar to basically create an event and uh, whoever uh, subscribe to this web app can know what kind of event uh, basically they're gonna get a notification uh, uh, of what kind of event gonna be held maybe this week uh, in a month or in the next six months or something like that so that's kind of a feature that we want to add into the system also yep there's a lot of features that we actually are thinking of uh, inserting into this system right now but for the time being uh, our main focus is to apply or basically use TypeScript uh, in this particular uh, project. So uh, what we are going to do for this series, uh, it might not be like until uh, we uh, apply all features, but uh, for this series, I think uh, we're going to go until we able to like uh, do uh, the main features, uh, which is uh, registration using uh, a card reader. So for today, uh, so basically for this first episode, we're going to go through uh, learning about TypeScript first or get to know about TypeScript first together, uh, the configuration of TypeScript. And we, if we have time, then we're going to uh, configure our uh our next app uh next app uh oh sorry about that next app with mi theme and possibly we'll also uh configure uh our authentication process uh using uh next auth yeah so if you guys follow in uh, next JS framework uh, updates, currently right now we are in version of 12.2. Uh, we're in version 12.1. If I'm not mistaken, we got introduced with uh, custom server component. You can selectively uh, run a component on the server side or client side or both. Uh, and next update regarding uh, RFC layout where you have a nested layout. Uh, but that one, I think it's still in proposal. Proposal, whether we, they, I think they will implement that in the future. I will, they, they will definitely implement that in the future. So uh, that's nice also. Uh, I look into the blog myself able to read through that also and currently right now we in the phase of 12.2 uh, uh, is an update regarding the server component stuff uh, changes made to uh, middleware how middleware works uh, previously middleware you can basically uh, like put uh, like a middleware in uh, subfolders, subtree of your folders. Right now, we only have just one middleware. We act, where it acts as a root middle, middleware, so we don't need any more. Or they 
actually remove support for uh, let you use the middleware in your pages directory, which uh, they talk about uh, why uh, they uh, remove that kind of ability since middleware gets uh, run every time you hit a certain URL, certain path. So if you have like a nested middleware, so basically you have to go through all that middleware. So that's why uh, they just take out that uh, features or, or how uh, they did middleware before and just have just one root of middleware. So you can go over that and get to know about middleware also. Uh, new, <laughs> new ways how to do of how you can like use middleware. Yep, so basically in this current video, we're going to go through TypeScript stuff. And also, if we have time, we're going to uh, like configure our NSMB MUI theme and also do our authentication process using NetLoth, all in TypeScript. Uh, but uh, I'm going to say it to you guys, um, not like upfront, uh, since I don't know much about TypeScript, so basically our configuration setup uh, for this two part, we might take some time to like make sure uh, that works and there's no like uh, linting error or something so we have to make sure that uh, we don't have any test script error when doing this kind of uh, uh, when doing this configuration setup yep so let's go through uh thing or get to know about test script uh i'm gonna open a video uh, this one, this video is a uh, type screen for beginner. Is for uh, Max Max Maximilian, if I um, uh, uh, pronounce it right. Uh, the guy from Academy. Uh, I love this guy, guys. Uh, his way of teaching uh, people is uh, for me is easy for me to understand how to uh, do stuff when like. Uh, learning it from him uh, and I even enrolled in a course or uh, a creative uh, from him in uh, I don't know Udemy if I'm not mistaken yeah, I bought a course which is a course uh, regarding React uh, so next year uh, like two years ago if I'm not mistaken yeah like I said guys I'm new to next year also React so basically I just learned everything from Maximilian uh you can go through this video uh i'm gonna like uh, give you guys a link to this video you can just like search uh typescript academy Acad uh, and then uh it will like basically give you this video link from two years ago uh 2020 uh so i skip whole bunch like two hours and a half almost two hour and a half part of it of this video uh this uh, basically the the two hour uh, almost two hour and a half part the first part of the video is basically max are uh, going through uh a life from the basic thing of basic of the script uh when you're not using any uh, framework until like uh, you get into a framework so uh currently right now it's not yet we are not yet in uh, at this point right now we're not yet uh not use any framework uh, the reason why i go to this part is uh i i skip like, the learning part of typescript or the types of typescript like a number string or the how you can use that or the variation of that you can go through that yourself this two hour almost two hour and a half uh, uh, the first part of it until at this point where we're gonna see uh, like a configuration for TypeScript which uh, most probably not most probably I think this is the most important part regarding TypeScript the configuration of TypeScript how we need uh, like to configure our TypeScript uh, in a, our system how we can do that and basically uh, from this point on forward, he's gonna go through that configuration part and let us know uh, the pitfall, I mean, uh, 
not just the bit for how to use that configuration, how to make use of that configuration. So let's go it through together, guys. So uh, first of all, and we only need to. Uh, I'm gonna let Maximilian go, go through his video. So time from time to time, we, I'm gonna pause it and we are just gonna like uh talk it over. So uh, uh, let's get it. Do this once running TSC dash dash init. So I yeah. So basically, what he's doing uh, currently right now, he create a project himself. Uh, where we have a uh, app.js, we also have index.html, uh, and we also have uh, an analytics of TS, which basically just calls a long sending this content of it. Uh, currently, right now, there's no configuration on the script part. So, the way that we can like get that configuration file, uh, we can just like write TSC dash dash, dash in it. I'm not pointing at a specific file here. I just run TSC and then dash dash in it here. And again, this is only required once. It will initialize this project in which you run this command as a TypeScript project. That means it will now basically tell TypeScript that everything in the folder where you run this command, and therefore it's important that you navigate it into the right folder before you ran this command with the built-in terminal here in VS Code, I'm automatically in this project folder where my files are, so that this project is now managed by TypeScript. So let's hit enter, and what this does is it creates this tsconfig.json file. This basically is the indicator for TypeScript that the project in which this file lies and all subfolders of this folder should be managed by TypeScript. Now, if we have a look into this file, we see there are a bunch of options, most of them commented out, they're just there so that you see that you could set them and you got a short explanation here as well. But we don't have to worry about those right now. We'll dive into them in a second. For the moment, let's just close this file here and let's see what this gives us. Because what it does give us is that we can now run just TSC like this without pointing at a specific file. And what this will do is it will tell TypeScript to go ahead and compile all TypeScript files. All right, so you guys might uh, find it confusing why he's talking about uh, you don't have to point to any file when running TSC. So basically, previously, uh, like previous two hours of it is, uh, when he's teaching about TypeScript, uh, he teach about how you can selectively run or compile uh, any file in your system uh, using TSC. So basically, you have to like, uh, use TSC and point to which file that you want it uh, to be compiled. Like you want it to just compile analytics, then you have to use TSC and point it to an analytics file, and it will uh, generate a, a .js file. So basically, TypeScript is just uh, a superset of JavaScript where uh, you write everything in TypeScript and uh, browser can't read TypeScript, browser can only read JavaScript. So TypeScript uh, uh, gonna come to it, it own compiler when you run TSC and point to which file that you want to compile and it will generate a .js file. So yeah, so uh, if you don't use any framework or set up your TypeScript configuration then you, you need to run it every time or you can run it as a listener whenever you hit save then you will reach regenerate regenerate a, a dot js file of a given uh ts file that you have in your uh, in your project so uh and basically our browser always is we use a dot js one instead of the ts one Yep, so that's why he meant by selectively point to any file uh, using TSC. So that's uh, how we are at this point right now. What, what he's talking about. Okay, let's continue. Files, so all .ts files, it can find in this project. So if I hit enter here, you see this takes a while. And now what we got is this analytics.js file and this app.js file. Now the analytics.js file was just created by TypeScript because it 
found that we have the analytics.ts file, and as I said, it will now compile all TypeScript files in the project. And of course, this can also be combined with watch mode. You can run tsc-w or dash dash watch as I showed before, and this will now enter watch mode for all TypeScript files. So now, whenever I change one of them and I save it, it will recompile, and it will recompile that file that changed and therefore also reflect the change in the JavaScript file. And hence now here, if I go back to my page, we see sending data here as well, because now the analytics TS file was also compiled. So this is now how we can manage multiple files with TypeScript. Now one word about having multiple files, when you work with multiple files, as we're doing it here, you can also import them into each other with modules, which you might know from vanilla JavaScript. There we have modules as well. It is something I'll cover in a dedicated section of this course though. So for now, we just have two files which are not imported into each other, but which are instead imported into index.html. Now with that out of the way though, we know that we can manage this as a project and that we can compile multiple files here. Now let's have a look at the tsconfig.json file, because this is a crucial file for managing this project. It essentially tells TypeScript how it should compile these files. Now, before we dive into the compiler options, where we, as the name suggests, can configure how the compiler behaves, let's scroll down to the place before the closing curly brace, but after this nested closing curly brace. And let's see some of the options we can add here, which don't affect the compiler or the compilation step behavior, but instead how the compiler works with this project. Because there... All right, guys. So basically, uh, this configuration of uh creature file of for TypeScript is what control what gets uh compile how you compile them how you want TypeScript uh behave in your system basically so this is how uh we usually do it when we like create a project from the scratch without using any framework uh i don't know about this specifically but i because i don't have any prior uh, experience coding in TypeScript or using TypeScript in any kind of project. So uh, I don't know whether this uh, was I'm, I'm going to say to you guys is true or not. But uh, when I look into uh, framework stuff, uh, you have the option to like uh, uh, basically save or get uh, that particular framework in uh, without TypeScript or with TypeScript option. So when you get one with TypeScript version, they already come with a default uh, TypeScript configuration for that particular uh, project that you downloaded. So they might not have the same, uh, I mean like configuration, uh, like what we see here, but I do think that they have the same like a key value pair that we can see over here because it's, that's going to be like by default it's going to be the same throughout what kind of any kind of framework that you use as long as you use TypeScript you're going to have you will use the same like inline source map inline sources or this kind of uh, option that you can uh, toggle true or false uh, to like manage your TypeScript behavior on your system so uh, I just want uh, to let you guys know that uh, whatever that we have in our tsconfig.json over here uh, uh, is going to be the same when you have or you use different framework. Uh, it's just that you don't have to like, have to have the need to run tsc uh, dash dash in it anymore since you already like get uh, the project. Uh, with TypeScript uh, came like by default. Uh, yep, like I said earlier, you guys. Uh, since we, I mean, I, I just said we because maybe most of you probably that uh, watch my video is gonna be uh, or interested in watching this video. You also might be a newbie in TypeScript so basically that's why I'm so I, I said we so basically we currently 
don't have any uh, knowledge about TypeScript. So if we want to like refract the code from JavaScript to TypeScript, it's gonna take us like a lot of time to get uh, like get the right way of how to do TypeScript. So that's why uh, currently right now we straight away gonna use uh, or create a new project using right away have support for TypeScript instead of have to refactor the code from JavaScript to TypeScript. Uh, we can do that after we finish this uh, system. Uh, I think by that time we might have uh, like a lot more understanding about TypeScript uh, for us to like refactor the code from JavaScript to TypeScript. Yep. Uh, let's continue guys. Here for example, you can set a exclude option. Now, if you add exclude here, that will be an array. And what you can enter here are paths to files which should not be included in compilation when you run TSC on the entire project. So for example, here we could say we want to exclude analytics TS from compilation. Now, of course, this does make much sense here, but just to show how this works. If we do that, and we now rerun TSC, and I first of all delete analytics.js so that we can see if it is recreated, if we now run TSC or TSC in watch mode, you see no analytics.js file is created. And the reason for that is that we're excluding that file. Now, of course, for this file, this doesn't make a lot of sense because I typically want to include it. But if you had a file that for some reason shouldn't be compiled, you can exclude it like this. You can also work with wildcards. And for example, if you had a file that's named analytics.dev.ts, and you don't really wanna compile that, you could say all files that end with dev.ts should not be compiled. And you can do that by also adding an asterisk here, which is a, a wildcard basically. And now TypeScript will ignore any files that have .dev.ts included. You could also add asterisk asterisk slash here, and that would mean any file with that pattern in any folder will be ignored. So these are things you can set up here. The only thing I want to set up here, and that is a setting you will often find, is that I want to exclude node modules. And the idea here is that I don't want to compile any TypeScript files I might have inside of node modules. Now, node modules is that folder that holds all the dependencies we install here in package.json and the dependencies of these dependencies. And therefore, these are third-party libraries we're importing, which we don't want to touch. And if any of these libraries should ship some TypeScript code, then we certainly don't want to compile it. It will just slow down our compilation process, and in the worst case, it might even break our project. So therefore, it's quite common to exclude node modules here. Though I will say, if you don't specify the exclude option at all, node modules is automatically excluded as a default setting. So you don't really need to add this option here. This would be the default. I just want to show that exclude exists and how you could use it. If the only thing you want to exclude is node modules, you don't have to add the exclude key at all. If you do add it though, you should set node modules because otherwise it will not exclude that. Now besides exclude, we also have include and include allows you to do the opposite. It allows you to specifically tell TypeScript which files you want to include in the compilation process. And anything that's not listed here will not be compiled. So if I point at apptS here, you'll see if I rerun TSC, we also will get no analytics.ts file or no analytics.js file, I should say. Why? Because analytics.js is not included in include. And as I said, if we do set the include key, then we really have to include everything we want to compile. So of course here, we could then also add analytics.ts here. And with that addition, we would start and compile it. As you see now, we have the analytics.js file. Or as an alternative, we specify a whole folder here, which typically holds the files we want to compile. Exclude, by the way, if set alongst include, will filter down include. So if we exclude some subfolder of a folder that is part of include, then that excluded subfolder will be excluded. So basically, we compile include minus exclude. Now, of course, here, I don't want to set include. I want to compile all TypeScript files, and therefore, I don't have to worry about that. Excluding node modules is all I need, and as I explained, theoretically, I don't even need to add that because that would be excluded by default. 
Now you also have a files option. This allows you to point at individual files. So it's a bit like include with the difference that here you can't specify whole folders which you want to include. Instead, you really just specify the individual files you want to compile. That might be an option for smaller projects where you know you will only work with free files. And for some reason, you got a couple of other TypeScript files which you don't want to touch though. Then you can set a list of files like this. In reality, you might not need that setting that often though. And therefore, that's it with the basic compilation or project management options here. Now, of course, there is way more we can specify though, way more we can specify about the compiler itself and how it behaves during the compilation step. Uh, one thing to note, guys, uh, since this video is from 2020, so I wouldn't know uh, all the key that we have in here, compiler option or on in general in uh, tsconfig.json file that we're currently looking at, uh, at it right now, uh, have the same key that uh, Max is currently going to uh, like, let us know. So uh, just keep that in mind, guys. These uh, keys uh, you see over here might have changed now in 2022. Uh, might, uh, that's why I say might or might not be changed at all. Or we might have an additional key that have been added for from the past two years. I don't know. Uh, so just keep that in mind. So now that we have a understanding of how we can manage our files with the compiler, let's dive into the compiler options because that's really interesting. This allows us to control how our TypeScript code is compiled. So not only which files, but also how the files which are getting compiled are treated by TypeScript. And there you see we have a bunch of options. Now you got short explanations next to these options. Some explanations arguably are a bit cryptic, others are quite clear. And I will say that a lot of these options, most of these options will not matter in most projects. So you'll not set all of these options, not even close. You typically can ignore a lot of these options. Now I will pick up on the important options here throughout this course, because some options only make sense when we learn about a certain feature. And I want to dive into some options right now already though. And for that, let's go through that file from, from top to bottom and see what we got there. And let's start with the target option. As you see, this actually is set by default. It's not commented out. And what you do with this option is you tell TypeScript for which target JavaScript version you want to compile the code. Because what TypeScript does is it does not just compile new features like the type annotations that don't exist in JavaScript to JavaScript code. So it does not just take care that this here works. It also compiles the code to JavaScript that runs in, in a certain set of browsers. And you basically define which browsers support the compiled code by setting the target. The default target here in this project, as you see, the initial target which is getting set up is ES5, which means all TypeScript code is compiled down. And we can actually see that. If I run TSC here to compile all my files, we see in apt.js I'm using let and const, but in app.js we see var. And that happens because we got a target of ES5 and in ES5 world, we don't have let and const. So the good thing here is that we can use TypeScript to generate code that works in older browsers as well. But it's totally up to us if we want to do that. Maybe we don't want to do that with TypeScript because maybe we got some other build tool that will then take care about the JavaScript transpilation and therefore we don't want to have TypeScript do that. Or maybe we want to ship code that only works in modern browsers because we know our app only will run in modern browsers. And therefore, alternative options can be seen here if you delete the value and then here in VS Code at least, if you hit control space to get the auto completion, you see a bunch of suggestions and you see all available values here. Now over time, this of course will change because we got new JavaScript versions released. You saw we set this to ES5 before. If you don't specify target at all, then right now TypeScript compiles to ES3 even, so it supports an even older version. 
but you can also go with ears. Yep, like uh, Max said just now, uh, right currently right now we already have support for ES2022, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, at this time, when Max doing the uh, video, is only supported to ES2020. So let's go through, uh, I mean, uh, let's just what or which uh, target uh, JavaScript that Max is going to go with. Six, which is more modern, which for example supports constant let or take an even more recent version. ES6 is the equivalent to ES2015, just for the record. So if we set this to ES6, for example, and I rerun the TSC command after changing the tsconfig.json file, you will see that now in app.js we got let and const, because now that is supported there. So that is up to you, of course, the more modern of a JavaScript version you pick here, the more concise your generated code is because TypeScript has to compile less and less code or it has to work around non-existing features in less situations. And therefore, the compiled code typically is then more concise and shorter. So that's the target. What about the other options? We also got module here. Now, module is an option I'll skip for now because it really only makes sense once we learn about modules in TypeScript and how we can connect multiple files. So let's ignore that for now. Lib is an interesting one though. Lib is an option that allows you to specify which default objects and features TypeScript knows. With that, I mean things like working with the DOM. Let's say in index.html, we have a button. And on this button, we say, click me. And when we click this button, we just want to print the message. Now in app.ts, we can select this button. We can get access to this button with document query selector, for example, selecting the first button we find. Now, if we do that, then this works. We get no TypeScript error here. So if I go to my button and I add an event listener here, I get an error here actually because TypeScript doesn't know for sure whether we find a button here. For now, we can work around that with an exclamation mark after this line, and I'll come back to what exactly this does in the future. It basically tells TypeScript, don't worry, such a button will exist. We will get a value here. So now we can add a click event here and then define some anonymous function maybe where a console log clicked. Now, the interesting thing here is not so much that I had to add the exclamation mark. As I said, I will come back to that. But that if I run TSC, this just compiles. Now, shouldn't TypeScript complain that document is unknown to it? How does it know that we have such a document constant or variable available? How does it know that even if we have that available, that it holds an object which has a query selector method? How does it know that button is something which has an add event listener method. How does TypeScript know all of that? Now you might say, of course it knows, because in vanilla JavaScript, this would be valid code. But keep in mind that when you write TypeScript code, you don't necessarily write it for the browser. You could be writing your Node.js application with TypeScript, and there indeed, this would all not work. So the reason why this works is this lib option. And as you see, it's not even set here, but if it isn't set, then some defaults are assumed. If it's not set, the defaults depend on your JavaScript target here. And for ES6, it by default includes all the features that are globally available in ES6. For example, the map object, which is available in ES6. Therefore, it wouldn't complain if you use map. So it assumes all these ES6 features which are made available globally in JavaScript that they are available in TypeScript as well. And in addition, it assumes that all DOM APIs are available. You find the detailed descriptions about all these options, by the way, in the official docs, which are linked in the lecture at the end of this module. So long story short, if the lib option is not set, some defaults are assumed. And these are typically the defaults you need to have TypeScript run in the browser. So all the DOM APIs and so on. If we comment this in, and I now compile everything, 
I therefore get an error because now by commenting it in, we don't have the default settings anymore. Instead, we now say, hey, please include some default libraries, so some default type definitions, you could say, which I will give you in this array. And as you see, I'm not passing any description, any paths, any values here. And therefore, what I'm saying to TypeScript now is, hey, regarding all the defaults, you know, please take this into account and you know nothing. So only if that's commented out, it works because then TypeScript will assume some defaults. If I set the defaults explicitly, well, then TypeScript, of course, adheres to what I'm setting here. And hence here, for example, it doesn't know document. It doesn't even know the console here. So therefore, we want to set this to more reasonable values. And again, if you hit control space in here, you get auto completion. And for example, there we could add DOM. That's an identifier, and there are some predefined identifiers which TypeScript understands. Again, you find a complete list in the official docs. The docs for this option are attached to this lecture as well. So this is an identifier TypeScript understands, and it's an identifier which basically unlocks all the DOM APIs in TypeScript so that TypeScript understands what you're doing there. So now already you see it knows console, it knows document, and so on. So now since we're working with next-gen JavaScript, we should also add the ES6 option so that TypeScript also understands all globally available ES6 options. And it's also a good idea to add DOM iterable and script host. With that here, we would unlock all the core JavaScript features you would want to work. And this, by the way, is the exact default setup you get when you set target to ES6 anyways. So if you comment this in and set it up like this, you have exactly the same behavior as if you don't specify lib at all. Now here I will comment it in though, and with that, this will compile. Again, setting this is a bit redundant though, just want to explain what it does. Now, also interesting is allow.js. With allow.js, and by the way, also with check.js, you can also include JavaScript files in the compilation. Now, with allow.js, a JavaScript file will be compiled by TypeScript. So even if it doesn't end with .ts, TypeScript will compile it. With check.js, it will not compile it, but it will still check the syntax in there and report potential errors. This could be nice if you don't really want to use TypeScript, but you want to take advantage of some of its features. And as far as TypeScript can help you with the any type only, which is effectively what you have in JavaScript, it will do so if you enable these options. Now, we don't need it for this project. And for this project, we would want to make sure we don't double compile these JavaScript files, which do stem from TypeScript files. So we would have to tweak the include and exclude settings a bit. But you could use that in projects where you don't want to use TypeScript at all, or where for whatever reason you have some vanilla JavaScript files next to your TypeScript files, and you want to check the vanilla JavaScript files as well. Now let's fast forward a bit. JSX is an option that can help you with React.js, which does not really matter for us here. Declaration and declaration map is also not important here. DTS files are an advanced concept, which matter to you if you're shipping your project as a library to other people, and you need a, basically a manifest file, which describes all the types you have in your project. That's such a DTS file. Source map is an interesting one, though. Source map helps us with debugging and development. So to show what this does, let me compile everything without that source map setting. If we now go to the browser and we want to understand what our code does, we can go to the sources tab here in the developer tools. And there we find our JavaScript files. Now we can dive into these files. And the good thing is these files are fairly readable to us humans, of course, because they contain JavaScript code in the end. Now that's good, but what if we had more complex TypeScript code and we want to debug our TypeScript code and not the compiled JavaScript code? In other words, it would be nice if we would see the TypeScript files here and not the JavaScript files. With the source map option, you can get there. If you set this to true and you run the TSC command again, then you see we got these .js.map files being generated as well. Now, if we look at them, they're pretty strange files. But what they do is they basically act as a bridge, which is understood by modern browsers and the developer tools there, 
to connect the JavaScript files to the input files. So with these files generated, if I reload here, you see in the sources tab, we now not just have our JavaScript files, we also see our TypeScript files there. And we can even place breakpoints in the TypeScript files. And if I now click on that button, for example, it pauses in the TypeScript file, which is of course super, super convenient because that really takes our debugging process to the next level because we can work directly in our input files, basically in our TypeScript files instead of the JavaScript files. Now, nonetheless, here I'll comment this out because we have a fairly simple project here and I don't want to have these extra .map files lie around here, but this is super useful in projects because it simplifies debugging. Let's move on. We got the out file option here. Now, this option does not matter to us right now. It won't work right now. More interesting to us is out dir and root dir. The bigger your project gets, the more you might want to organize your files. Typically, you don't just want to have your files lie around here in your root level project folder. Instead, what you often will see in projects is that you have a source folder and you have a dist folder next to next. So the dist folder has the job of holding all the output, so all the JavaScript files, let's say, and the source folder might hold all our TypeScript files. So we can move the TypeScript files into the source folder. And if I now delete the JavaScript folder, we have the problem that if we compile everything, these TypeScript files are compiled because TypeScript, the compiler, does look into subfolders, but the output sits next to our input files. And that's something we can control with the outdir, for example. If we set outdir, we can tell the TypeScript compiler where the created files should be stored. We could set this to dist. Now, if we do that, then if you run TSC, you will see that the JavaScript files indeed are not placed in the source folder, but in the dist folder. Now we just have to adjust our index.html file and there point at dist app.js and dist analytics.js or alternative. All right, guys. So for this part, right, the outer uh, explained by Max, because uh, currently Max are using, there's no framework uh, being used here. So basically he create his own way of how to manage his system. So uh, when he do TypeScript in it, or DSC in it, so basically get the dsconfig.json, he can basically manage where to put his uh, compiled version of JavaScript in like this folder over here uh, by specifying specifying them in the uh, dsconfig.json uh, file. But when you, we use a framework, uh, framework has their own way of how they do things. So basically compile the JavaScript and place it in some file. I don't know about that, guys. Uh, since currently uh, in my company right now, we are refactoring our code from JavaScript to TypeScript, but I'm not the one who set up the initial uh, refactor code from JavaScript to TS, or uh, what I mean by uh, to TypeScript actually, it was done by one of our developers. He basically do the configuration part of it, the initial configuration part of it. Uh, so what uh, other developers have to do is just uh, right away in JavaScript code, they just need to like uh, rename the file from uh, dot js to dot ts or tsx uh, if if uh, you, you you use component then you should name as uh, jsx instead of uh, i mean a tsx instead of uh, ts so and also we need to specify types of of uh, or basically handle any linting error or uh, in our uh, file so and that's what we are currently doing right now. But that's why I say to you guys, I'm still a newbie in TypeScript. So I don't know like really how to reflect the code from JavaScript to TypeScript, like do the initial process of it. So just want to let you guys know that what you are seeing here, what being done by Maximilian, it's, uh, I don't know whether this is correct or not, uh, but I'm just going to say it is only 
um, possible when we do it in a non-framework kind of system but in framework kind of system you have to get to know about the system first and go through the documentation for the system if you want to like refactor to test script uh, you have to go to the documentation for the framework themselves and uh, see how you can migrate using js to typescript uh, according to their documentation they will usually they will let us know how to do that and you at least have to know uh, basic not basic I, I mean like maybe you we have to know about typescript first in order for us to like do the migration right uh, like do the migration correctly so just to let you guys know uh, regarding this part okay let's continue move the index.html file into the dist folder but then our dev server wouldn't work correctly anymore right now so let's just adjust these imports and with that we got a working application still as you see but now with a cleaner project structure now the good thing is if we had a subfolder here an analytics folder let's say and we had our typescript file in there then if we recompile and it does not matter if you do it with this command or in the watch mode this folder structure you have in the source folder will also be replicated in the dist folder, which is of course very convenient because that makes sure that you can import the files basically as you would import them in the source folder as well, so that the structure you set up there is kept. Now you can also set the root directory and set this specifically at the folder where your files are stored in, like in this example source, to make sure that the TypeScript compiler does not look in other folders, that's also something you could do with the include option down there, right? But with root directory, the TypeScript compiler will not just look only at that source folder. It also makes sure that the project structure you set up there is kept in a dist folder. Now it did so by default before, as you saw, but keep in mind that before it would have included any TypeScript files here, all the outside of source. So, for example, if we comment this out temporarily, if we had a user folder here on the top level with a user TS file, where we have a username of max, let's say, then if we compile this, you will also see that user folder in the dist folder. And now the source folder is included as well, because now we have a TypeScript file on a higher level, and therefore the TypeScript compiler thinks that our whole project again is the input and it replicates the folder structure it finds there in the dist folder. Now that's of course not what we would want and that's where the root dir option helps us. Now if we set this to source, even if we had other folders with TypeScript files in there on the root level, they would not be included in the output and the source folder itself would not suddenly end up there. So often you set both root dir and out dir to be really clear regarding where your input files live and where your output files should be generated in. If we move on, we can ignore composite. We can have a look at remove comments. Should be pretty clear. If you set this, then any comments you might have in your TypeScript files will be removed in the compiled JavaScript files. So if I comment this in, and I compile my code, you see in app.ts I have a comment, in app.js it's not there. So you can do that to make your files smaller and therefore this might be a nice option. You can also set no emit if you don't want to generate any JavaScript files. Now this might sound strange because that's the idea of TypeScript, but if you just want to check whether your files are correct but you don't want to write all these output files, to save some time, for example, in a bigger project, then you could set this to true to just have the TypeScript compiler check your files and report any potential errors without actually creating an output file. Import helpers is uh, not really important to us here. We can ignore that. Down level iteration is an advanced option. It is interesting when you compile your code to older versions of JavaScript and you work with for loops, then in some rare scenarios, you could run into issues where the compilation doesn't work correctly. This option, if you turn it on, gives you a more exact compilation, which will work in these niche cases. So therefore you might think you should always turn it on, but it will also output more verbose code. So you should only turn this on if you have loops and you see that your generated code suddenly behaves differently than it should regarding those loops. We can ignore isolated modules, 
But there is one other option, which is actually not even mentioned here, which I still want to mention myself though. And that's the no emit on error option. You can set this to true or false and the default is false. And what does this do? If we set it to false, let me show you where this might be a problem. It is a problem if we introduce an error or it can be a problem. Let's say here, I do have my button and I remove this exclamation mark. Now, even though we don't fully understand what's going on, the problem here simply is that TypeScript does not know that we certainly have a button here. After all, when querying for a button, we might not get one. If there is no element in the DOM satisfying this selector, then this will return null. And that's basically what TypeScript complains about. Here we access something on a potential null object and that's not good. Now, that's an error we have here. If we compile our code, we also get this error here in the console. Nonetheless, the file is created. So even if I delete the app.js file, it will be recreated. So even if we have an error, TypeScript creates a JavaScript file. This might or might not be wanted. Maybe you have an error in your TypeScript file and you don't really know how to work around it, but you know it will not be a problem in the final app. Like here, even if we don't know about the exclamation mark, well, if we don't know about the exclamation mark, we might not know how to disable this error basically, but still we know that this will work in our page here. So we might be fine with compiling this despite having an error. But of course, in reality, you should aim for error-free projects and rather learn how you can work around this issue than ignore it. Nonetheless, you could set this to false or not set it at all because false is the default if you are fine with generating JavaScript files if you have an error. If you set this to true, however, what will happen is that problematic files will not be generated. If I now rerun this, you see nothing is generated actually. Even the analytics.ts file is not output there. If we have some content in there, besides console log, you see it's not getting generated. And the reason for that is that we have an error in a file. And if any file fails to compile, no files will be emitted. So here, therefore, we have to make sure we fix this error before we then can get TypeScript to again compile files for us. And therefore, it is an option I typically like to set because I'm not interested in getting JavaScript files if I still have errors in my TypeScript files. Yep, so for this part, I actually not confirm whether we have this option to set it when we use a framework like I'm using Next.js. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we don't use this flag of these options uh, in our uh, project. I mean, like me working in a company right now as a first set developer, uh, currently factoring code to TypeScript from JavaScript. Uh, I do look into our uh, tsconfig.json and if I'm not mistaken, we don't use this option. Maybe because how framework works, they have their own, like, like I said, out there, there, they have their own setup where you have to uh, use their own uh, the framework setup instead of uh, you specifying where uh, the file should go. Or maybe uh, if I'm wrong, we uh, actually have the ability to like uh, specify which uh, directory we want the compile version of JavaScript to be and which uh, part of our file or folder we want to be compiled. So I don't know, but if we, let's say for example sake or for logical sake, if we as a framework give that ability to user, then uh, like Next.js, they have their own way, uh, they have that this folder structure where you have to uh, use that kind of folder structure to, uh, but you can also opt out from using the uh, features where you use folder structure to manage your URL path, uh, how you call your URL, uh, API, uh, all those sort of things. So uh, that's why I say if you use their, their ways of how to like create a file, uh, manage a path, then I fall. 
logical thinking, we won't have the ability to like uh, animal this option, right? I don't know. Uh, if if I'm I'm, I'm wrong, then uh, you guys can uh, correct me. Okay, let's continue. So that was an important first set of options. Now let's dive into these strict options because these are pretty interesting. There is this strict true option and actually what this does is it enables all strict type checking options. So effectively setting this is the same as if you would set all these options separately. So you can either set all these options one by one or just set this option. Of course, you want to set the individual options if you want to have some options set to false, because otherwise they're all set to true. If you want them all set to true, then using just this option is of course way shorter. Now what do these options do though? Let's start with no implicit any. No implicit any is a quite interesting option that helps us write better code. Let's go to our analytics file here and there let's add a function send analytics that gets a data option, let's say. And there we could send this to a server, but here I'm just console logging it. Then I call send analytics with the data, so with the string. Now, as you see, my IDE already complains here and so does TypeScript, the compiler, because the two of course are connected if I try to compile this. Parameter data implicitly has an any type. So this seems to be related to this no implicit any option. Indeed, if I set this to false, so if I set all strict options to true, but I set this option to false, which I can do, then this error goes away, both in the IDE and when we compile the code. So what does this option do? It ensures, and I'll comment it out again to turn it on again because of strict true, it ensures that we have to be clear about our parameters, about the, the values we're working with in our code. Here, we don't give TypeScript any information about the type of data we'll get as a parameter here, and we should. If TypeScript is able to infer this, then of course it's fine, but here, how would TypeScript be able to infer it from this line? Well, keep in mind that this function gets declared first before this file executes. So at the point of time when the function is created, there is no chance of knowing what will end up in there. So here we can fix this error by simply declaring the type and being clear about which type we use there. Now, please note that if you had a variable locked and you set this to true here, you don't get an error about this declaration, even though it also gets a default type of any. For variables, this is okay. For parameters, it's not okay. Why is it okay for variables? Because what TypeScript does for variables, what is possible for variables, what's not possible here because the function is created first. Here, TypeScript is able to track the values you assign. You see, okay, I got locked here like this. Now I set it to true. So therefore thereafter, if I console log locked here, it's a Boolean. So TypeScript is here able to understand the flow of your code and therefore you don't need to be precise regarding the type here. Of course, you wanna be precise if you want to avoid that you can freely assign a new value, which you can do here because it is of type any. So you wanna still assign a type to avoid this, but TypeScript is at least able to find out if the code you're calling works with the type it currently holds. That's not the case here because there the function is defined before you call it and therefore TypeScript would have no chance of knowing if what you pass in there can be used inside of the function. Strict null checks is another important option. It's actually related to our button selection, which we have here. Remember, I had to add this exclamation mark here to make it work, otherwise I'd get an error. Now we can also get rid of that error without adding the exclamation mark by setting strict null checks to false. So let's do that here and let's save this. And as you see, this error is now gone here and I can compile all files. Now what do strict null checks do? They tell TypeScript to be pretty, well, strict regarding how you access and work with values that might potentially hold a null value. And button here might be null. It's not always pointing at a button element. It's not always pointing at such an element because even though you have such a selector here, 
a button might simply not exist on the page on which this script runs. And therefore, TypeScript can't tell because it's not diving into your HTML file and looking at that, it can't tell whether this will be successful or not. And if this fails to return a pointer at a DOM node, then it will return null or undefined to be precise, but that's treated equally here. So therefore, then button might hold a null value and therefore this code could fail. Indeed, if I comment out this button here, if I now compile everything, it works because I disabled the null checks, but I therefore now have a runtime error because I can't call event listener, add event listener on null. And I got null here because I got no button. Now, this is a mistake we could avoid by setting strict null checks to true. And that's automatically set if we have strict set to true, where TypeScript anticipates that this might happen and therefore forces us to work around that. Now, one cheap workaround is this exclamation mark operator here. This tells TypeScript that you, the developer, know that this button exists or that this operation will yield a non-null value. Now, maybe you do. You certainly do if you know that you are working on the HTML code and that there is a button here that this selector here will work. So it would be fine to use the exclamation mark in this scenario. If you have another scenario where you don't know for sure if it works and you just hope that it works, then it might be better to simply wrap the code that might fail in an if check, which will be there at runtime as well, of course. You could simply check if button is truthy which it won't be if it's null or undefined and move that code into this if check here. Now, even without the exclamation mark in strict null checks mode, we get no error because TypeScript understands that this code is inside of this if statement and that this if statement makes sure that button is not null and that this will not fail. So this might actually be the cleaner workaround. However, of course, to save code, if you know with certainty that something does exist, using the exclamation mark is shorter and an absolutely fine option. Here I set both so that we see both. Of course, you just need one of the two things, either the if check or the exclamation mark. Strict function types here is a little bit of a more advanced setting, uh, catching some, some niche bugs, which you might not have in many applications. It is related to, well, function types you might be setting up. So not types inside of functions, but if you define how a function should look like regarding its parameters and return value, and you create such a function type, which you learned about in the basics module, then there you can introduce bugs if you work with classes and inheritance, which we haven't learned about yet, which we haven't used yet, and therefore for now let's ignore this. Strict bind call apply. That can be helpful if you do work with bind, call, or apply. For that, let's quickly see an example. Here we have our, our button and our function there. Now let's say this would be a function which we define here with the function keyword or as an error function, doesn't matter. I'll use the function keyword here. Click handler. And in there, I console log clicked. And now here we point at click handler. And for some reason, we want to make sure that when this executes, we pass in certain arguments or we set the this keyword in there to a certain value. Now let's say here we do expect a message argument, which should be a string, and we want to output this here as well. Now, since click handler is passed to add event listener like that, so that the browser basically executes this for us, if we want to pre-configure the arguments which will be passed in, we can use bind. And bind as a first argument takes what we want to bind the this keyword to. And here we could say that does not matter to us because we're not using this in this function, so we bind it to null. Now you see here I get an error. I get an error that can be avoided if I set strict bind call and apply to false. Now you see the error is gone. Now what does this option do therefore? It basically checks on which function you're calling bind call or apply and it checks if what you're setting up here makes sense. And here TypeScript sees we want an argument, we want a parameter in click handler. With bind we're not configuring that though and therefore here we get an error. 
If I set this back to true or I just commented it out because of course it is set to true by default by setting strict to true, we therefore get the error again. Now if we wouldn't expect an argument here, you see the error would be gone down there if we also remove the message because TypeScript understands our code and sees you're not passing in any arguments to that method or to this function because it doesn't take any. So that's fine. But of course here we want one so we get an error. The solution is to provide this second argument here, which is the first argument we want to pass in. Now TypeScript is really smart here and for example if you pass in a number it would still complain because it understands that I need a string here. If I pass in a correct string though, like you're welcome, then it does not complain anymore because now it understands this and it sees that this is matching my function definition here. So this is a very useful behavior that makes sure that you don't accidentally use bind, call or apply in a way that does not work with your code. Now strict property initialization becomes important once we work with classes, we can ignore it for now. No implicit this also does not matter right now, it has to do with the this keyword and TypeScript basically tries to warn you if you use the this keyword in a place where it's not clear what it refers to. And always strict simply controls that the JavaScript files which are generated are using strict mode, so that this is added. With that we covered all these strict options. Now if we move on, we got more options, no unused locals, no unused parameters, no implicit returns. This helps you with code quality basically. TypeScript will complain if you have certain unused variables and so on. So if we turn these three options on for example, this option helps you with switch statements where you might forget the break keyword. But if we turn these three options on, what TypeScript will complain about is for example if you had a username variable here locally in this function and you don't use it. You see this has yellow squiggly lines because it's not an error really, it's more like a warning or a hint. So if I compile here, you see now however I do get an error because TypeScript only knows errors and there we see that username is declared but its value is never read because we made sure that we don't want unused local variables unused global variables, so if I had something like app ID here, are allowed though because TypeScript can't know if you maybe need that globally defined value in another script file. So therefore this is allowed, but in a function where there is no other place where you could need it, TypeScript will complain now if you have unused code. And that's generally a good idea, allows you to strip out such unused code. Same goes for unused parameters, if you would take a h here, for one of course bind is broken now, but even if we pass this in, this works, but now again TypeScript and therefore also the IDE tells us that this is unused, and indeed it is, so maybe we should remove it or start using it. So that's no unused parameters. And no implicit returns means that we'll get an error, if we have a function that sometimes returns something and sometimes it does not. Let's say we have another function add where we get two numbers, number and, and two is a number. And of course we can return n1 plus n2. But let's say we're for some reason checking if n1 plus n2 is greater than zero because we only want to return if we have a result greater than zero. And then we want to return the value, otherwise we want to return nothing, we don't want to return. Well then we get a warning because of that extra setting with no implicit returns. TypeScript detects that not all branches in this function lead to a return statement and because of our setting that's not allowed. We at least have to deliberately not return anything here by adding the return keyword. Just omitting it is not allowed here. It is allowed if you have a function that does not return anything in no branch, but if you have at least one case where your function does return something, then you have to make sure you return something in all cases. And with that we're nearing the end of this config walkthrough. We can ignore the module resolution here. All these options actually are pretty advanced and don't matter to us here, don't matter to you in a lot of projects. Source map options allow you to tweak these source maps we had a look at earlier. So these translation files from JavaScript to TypeScript. Typically default settings should be fine here, so if you don't know 
what you're changing and why you're doing it. You typically don't need to change anything here. And regarding these experimental options, I'll have a look at them specifically at experimental decorators later in the decorators module. This basically enables certain features to be used in TypeScript, which are really experimental, where it's not sure if they will end up in JavaScript at some time in the future, and uh, where you still might want to work with them, then you explicitly have to tell TypeScript that you want to work with these features, and you can do that with that configuration. But again, I will come back to that. And therefore now, we walk through this file, a lot of options you can set there. And as TypeScript grows, you typically also get more and more options added here. Therefore, the official docs are, of course, always a great place to dive deeper and to make sure that you don't miss an interesting option that might help you in your project. So now that we have a properly configured project, let's dive a bit deeper into how you can debug your project or how you can have a great development flow. I showed you my basic IDE setup at the beginning of this course. Really make sure you got the right extensions installed. There, for TypeScript, it comes down to ESLint, which can help you with linting your TypeScript code, so with improving the code quality, though you might need additional configuration for ESLint to have an effect. It can help you in more advanced projects, though. But more interesting than that, you want to really use Prettier to automatically format your code and have a nicely formatted code. And you might want to give Debugger for Chrome a try because that allows you to debug your TypeScript files even from inside VS Code through Chrome, but without using the Chrome. Yep, as Maximilian said, uh, let's Chrome just go back a bit. Uh, yeah, when we use uh, TypeScript, uh, it will be much helpful if you guys have this kind of uh, extension. Uh, enable your ESLint also, uh, you can enable also Prettier. Uh, just to make sure that uh, we use the correct ESLint also. Uh, our configuration code for our Prettier. Uh, but I will show you or basically share with you guys the section of code. It's a JSON code uh, key and value pair where you can add in your visual code setting. So we will go through that as well. Yep, uh, let's uh, finish uh, this video with mess minute. Let's continue. Though you might need additional configuration for ESLint to have an effect. It can help you in more advanced projects though. But more interesting than that, you want to really use Prettier to automatically format your code and have a nicely formatted code. And you might want to give Debugger for Chrome a try because that allows you to debug your TypeScript files even from inside VS Code through Chrome, but without using the Chrome DevTools. Of course, you can use those as well. As you learned, if you do enable source maps here, which you can of course always do, you get these translated files there as well, which is really nice. But you can also use VS Code. You can place breakpoints here, let's say in the click handler. And now to launch your files here through VS Code, you need to enable source maps as well, but we still will be able to use T VS Code instead of the browser dev tools. So enable source maps, place your breakpoint, and then go to debug, start debugging. Now, the first time you run this, it should ask you for an environment. And there, with that debugger for Chrome extension installed, you should be able to choose Chrome. It will now go to a launch JSON file where you configure how it should launch that. And there, you should point it at localhost 3000 because that's where our development server is running. And of course, that process, so the npm start process, should be up and running. So point at localhost 3000 there. And as a web root, you can leave that placeholder here, which means this project folder is assumed to be the host of your files, which is the case. And now compile your code so that the source maps also are generated after setting the source maps config to true, so that we now have these in the JavaScript code. Then with your breakpoint added here and your launch JSON configured, let's run 
debugging here. Start debugging now for real and it will open up a new tab now automatically. This tab will be closed whenever you quit the debugging process or if you close the tab, the debugging process will quit. So now with that, you enter this debugging view here in VS Code where you can track variables, watch certain expressions and see the current call stack. And if you now click on click me, you should be taken back into the editor and code execution pauses at your breakpoint in the TypeScript file. And now you can walk through the file here, inspect local values for the, this keyword or for the message variable, for example, script wide variables you might have and global variables you got access to global objects. You can watch certain expressions like message plus multiple exclamation marks and well, then you can always track the value which is in there here in this window if you wanted to, so that would work. And you can see the current function call stack, for example, that we're currently in the click handler. And now you can step through your code with these controls to step to the next step, skipping over the next function call, stepping into the function call or stepping out of the current function call. And the call stack, of course, here will adjust according to that. And with that, can ignore this browser sync thing here. With that, you can always resume code execution by clicking the play button and only pause whenever you reach your breakpoint the next time. So this is how you can debug code. You can remove a breakpoint by clicking on it. This is how you can debug code from inside VS Code with the help of the built-in debugging tools, the Chrome debugger extension, the right configuration, and source maps, which are set up in your TypeScript config. And that's it for this module. We had a very detailed look at the TypeScript compiler, how you can configure. Yep, all right, guys, I think that's all from this video. So basically the reason why I show you guys this part of video is just so that we uh, have the idea what kind of uh, uh, TS config uh, configuration for TypeScript that we have to get to know. Uh, so that it will be easier for us to later when we do the configuration for next JS with TypeScript is already going to come to TypeScript. So we're just going to glance over the uh, TypeScript configuration that have been done by the MUI theme. Uh, so from there, we can change uh, whatever uh, configuration that we want to change uh, to fit our uh, according style but like maximilian uh, said just now uh it would be uh, much beneficial for us if we just uh, put it uh, everything to be strict uh, so that we will get to learn type scheme much more in depth instead of just uh, uh make it uh, the check functionality to be false uh, for almost all the options which that's gonna just uh, uh it's like when it's like uh we don't need to use JavaScript at all so that's what uh, we don't want to do so we're gonna make it so that everything will be in strict mode yep so uh currently we already like one hour and a half in this video so i think uh for now or oh, for this video uh today we just gonna finish it uh, uh until this part uh just get to know about javascript uh, I, I mean typescript the the especially on the configuration for uh, option for typescript like we just go through right now so let's end it here guys uh Next week, we're going to go um, through the configuration part for Next.js and also uh, with MUI theme. So uh, you can get into that uh, yourself first and we uh, later we'll go through. Uh, you can go through with me together uh, in my video. Uh, yep. So until next time, salam. Ciao, guys.